Hi, Great Sevens. Mr. Stewart here. Coming to you live from my own apartment here. Uh, I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. This is our screen for the day. We're starting our new unit, Chapter 4, which is the fur trade. And it's my favorite unit of all of Social 7. So, I hope you're watching from home, continuing your learning, and I hope that we can be back in the classroom as soon as possible. So, the fur trade. We've kind of talked a little bit about it from our chapters previously, but we're going to take a more focused look at how the fur trade shaped what we know to be modern Canada. What we really want to talk about is the economics of it. So the money, how did the money and the competition for these furs shape the fur trade? What role did the different players in our story, the French, the British, and the First Nation, what different roles did they play? And the impacts on the diverse peoples of Canada. And we talk about economic competition, we're talking about controlling more wealth than other people. You want to be the richest person in the room or the richest person in the fur trading post. Economic competition shaped the relationships, roles, and movement of people involved in the fur trade. We break it down into five different parts. And today in this video, we're going to talk about the first two parts. First one is the early fur trade. So the very, very beginning. Second one, the expansion inland. So moving deeper into Canada. The rival networks is number three. Number four is the drive west. And phase five is the monopoly in the west. All right, phase one. That is our early fur trade. Look at the dates. Those are important for us. This is the very, very beginning. If you remember back to even before Champlain, even before Cabot, all the way when people were first making contact. So 1500 to 1603. And we began with the cod fisheries. The Mi'kmaq and the Stratacona traded with Europeans, both British and French. The British set up stations on the shore to dry their fish, but they did not establish their permanent settlements meaning that they didn't set up a place to live permanently or full-time. They were just there to dry their fish. And while they were there, they traded some furs. So at the very start, remember that it was mostly for the fish that the Europeans were coming there, but as they went ashore, they also traded furs. Now this trade benefited both sides, both the First Nations peoples and the Europeans. We took a little bit look earlier on and we said that the First Nation point of view was that they wanted to trade to build relationships of peace and friendship. Whereas the motivation for the Europeans might have been more aligned with uh, making money and establishing these trade relationships. Now I got some questions for you. Don't have to write them down, I just want you to think about them in your head here. Most historians agree that early fur trade benefited both Europeans and First Nations. They also agree that the fur trade developed, as it developed, it became less beneficial to First Nations. Meaning that the First Nations people got less and less out of it. They got a worse deal as time went on. How might competition have changed the fur trade for the First Nations? And what that is asking is how might of uh, them having to compete to sell furs to different people changed the fur trade for them? Think about it in regards to environment, need for newer technologies, the way the First Nations peoples use the land, and how it might have affected their family life. How might competition have changed the fur trade for the First Nations people. Now I'm not going to give you an answer for this one because there isn't just one answer. You can think about how it changed in a number of different ways and I want you to kind of think 
of an idea for each of those four points that we have on our screen. All right, if you need a little more time, you can just pause the video, and then when you're ready to continue on, press play again. We're going to move on to our phase number two, and that was the expansion inland, meaning moving further west into Canada. So we move away a little bit from the shores, and we moved a little bit further towards places like Quebec and Montreal. Take a look at the times. This was 1603 to 1670. New France had a major role during this part of the fur trade. So we're taking a look at specifically New France. Not as much the 13 colonies and not yet at uh, the Hudson's Bay Company. We're taking just a peek at New France right now. Quebec and Montreal were the two main places where this fur trading occurred. The Windet and um, they acted as a middleman or middleman for the French and First Nations that traded with them. So, middlemen were people who helped out in the middle. If you think about a grocery store, the things that you would buy at a grocery store, well, all of those different things that you can buy came from somewhere else. And it would be very hard for our very big grocery stores like, say, Costco or Superstore, to go to each of those people that sell each of those products and buy them to put into the store so you could shop it. So often there's people called middlemen or distributors who would buy a whole bunch of things, keep them in one spot and then sell them again to somewhere else to sell them yet again. So they make it easier for the people who want to purchase something because they do a lot of the work of going out and gathering things uh, into one place where someone could buy it. Now, at this point in time, French, the French Hodicene War began. Remember that war lasted over a hundred years. When the Wendat were defeated, it created an opportunity for the Curieux de Bois to trade with First Nations. Now remember, those were our runners of our woods. And I got you to say that word out loud. At home, can you say that word? Coureur de bois, a runner of the woods. So they began to act as middlemen, expanding inland to get furs so they could bring it back to Quebec and Montreal to sell them and bring them back to Europe. Now, another thing that happened during this expansion inland phase was Catholic missionaries. So people of the church tried to convert First Nations to Christianity. Some changed their religions to strengthen military and trading alliances with the French. So some people actually did change their religions because they thought it might benefit them with both trade and uh, military might. Others did not, and they had a very different relationship. Furs and food became scarce. Traders and Traders and middlemen moved west to find new regions. Remember we said at the beginning that the French, they didn't really have that strong of a government when they came to New France. They said, go out, trade some furs, and why don't you set up shop while you're over there? You can build us a settlement if you go trade these furs. But really the people that were trading the furs, all they wanted to do was trade furs because they wanted to make the most amount of money possible. The fur trade. It did create new jobs. This was an impact of it. So, more furs to trade, more people needed to work. The Windet and the Coureur de Bois, they were a middleman. Being a middleman was a job in the fur trade, a very challenging job in the fur trade. You had to trek far out to meet whole bunches of people that didn't live very close together so you could gather their furs. They didn't have cars, didn't have speed boats. Everything they did, they had to either paddle themselves, go through the woods, sometimes in the winter, with waist-deep snow. It was not an easy life. The fur trade also, another impact here, is that it created alliances and conflicts. The French 
during the Winden versus the Haudenosaunee Dutch and British War. This was a competition in the fur trade. Now I'm going to leave you with this video with just our questions for phase number two. Now, what is the difference between a need and a want? Something that you need to live or something that you would want and make your life a little bit easier? Where do you think furs landed on this spectrum? How might needs and wants have affected trading and relationships? Was it things that Europeans were offering to First Nations in exchange for furs? Was it the Europeans who actually wanted the furs? List some examples of needs and wants in the trading relationships between the French and First Nations peoples during this phase of the fur trade. How do these needs and wants affect their relationships? Now in your head, I want you to answer all four of these questions and work your way through your worksheet. And that is where we are going to end off for our first video. Like I said at the start, I really hope that we're able to be together in person soon. And I look forward to when that can happen. But if not, if we have to stay at home a little bit longer, I encourage you and I, I challenge you and I expect that you're all taking your learning seriously at home and keeping up the really, really good work. So good job, everyone, and I hope to see you again really, really soon.